If you've been with us uh, for a little while, you know we've been journeying through the book of Ephesians together. <clears throat> we chose this book because this book, this one letter to the church in Ephesus is so rich. And Paul, in it, Paul lays out exactly what God accomplished for us in Jesus Christ and what God's plan and design are for us, for his church, what it means to be a Christian, what the church is, and what its purpose is, and how we're to live a Christian life. Paul wrote all of this to a group of Christians who were a mix of Jew and Gentile believers, mostly Gentile actually, who had come out of a pagan world, but like we talked about last week, they all had their traditions that they came out of. But they still had to live and operate within those traditions in the world. It kind of sounds a lot like us today, actually. That's just a quick overview of, of the book of Ephesians. In chapters 1 through 3, it teaches us what God's plan was and how he accomplished it. So Paul reveals that in Christ, we belong to God. We have redemption through the blood of Jesus, forgiveness of sins. Um, we've been chosen and adopted. We're part of God's family. We're all part of God's people, no matter where we've come from. We're one people. And we all have the Holy Spirit by whom we are sealed and in, with, in, well, uh, and in whom we have power to live a holy life. And he reveals that God's intent or plan was actually to redeem mankind for himself and then for those people, God's people, to be holy. That's God's plan. And he did this through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, once Paul laid out the new reality, he uses chapters 4 to 6 to tell us what this new life in Christ looks like, how we're to live it out, and how we can do what God has planned for us, how to live in this re new reality and respond to this grace, what this love of God looks like when it comes alive in us, and he also tells us how to tap into the power that's available to us. We're not going to get to all that today. We are not just... Just in case you're worried, we're not finishing the book of Ephesians today. Buckle up. <laughs> no. In chapters 1 through 5, Paul uses contrasts to show us first what we were and then what we are now. Remember, he says, you were far away, now you're near. You were lost, you're found. You were separated, you're brought together. All these contrasts. And, um, and you'll see he intends to use these contrasts as a mirror, a medium for self-reflection. So this morning we want to go one more time into the book of Ephesians with you. To look in the mirror. Look in the mirror of God's word and discover his will for his people, for, for us. Let's stand together and re read from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 32, and chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Let's read together. You were, you were taught, taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do, Do not, not let, let any unwholesome, unwholesome talk come, come out of your mouths, mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with, who, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love.
Just, just as, as Christ, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. If you were here last week, you'll remember that Kevin noted that while there are tons of lists, Paul uses lists all over the place. Um, we can't simply check off a list and call it good. And of course, in our passage this morning, Paul presents yet another list or two. But rather than viewing them as a list of do's and don'ts, we should notice that Paul's intent in the, with these lists is contrast. Paul holds up the old life next to the new life. Our life before Christ and our life in Christ. Now, if you take some time this week and you read through the entire book of Ephesians, you'll see how Paul does this repeatedly, over and over again telling us, you were that, now you are this. You did that, now do this. And I really encourage you, take some time, read the whole book of Ephesians straight through. It doesn't take that, much, that long, really. But this same the same pattern you'll find throughout. You were this, now you're this. And this is the same pattern that we find in our passage today. The beginning of the passage this morning tells us that we are to be made new, to take off the old and put on the new. It tells us the old is being corrupted by sinful desires, by the ways of the world. <clears throat> and these ways come from misplaced love and worship, which leads to death, to the futile thinking that we talked about last week. But the new self created to be like Christ is, is the result of a mind and life transformed by the Holy Spirit. This is a person who is guided by God's desires not their own, and this new self is righteous and holy through him. Later, Paul uses the imagery of light and darkness to contrast the way the be believers are to live with the godlessness, live among the godlessness of the world around us. He tells us we were darkness, and now we are light. And he says, now that you are light, now that you are light, live in the light. This is exactly what he told us at the beginning of chapter 4 when he said, live up to the calling you have received or live lives worthy of the calling you have received. And in Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, Paul puts it this way. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, he says, now that you follow Christ, now that you call yourself Christians, live like that. It's a novel idea. Now that you're one who is like Christ, live like Christ. If you remember from last week, Kevin talked about how it can be difficult to actually discern worldly ways of thinking because they're our home culture. You know, we were raised in worldly, we're, we were raised in this culture, in this world. And so it can be really difficult sometimes to discern our worldly ways of thinking. So sometimes, for instance, we tend to think, well, I wasn't all bad, right? I, ha I had some, some good stuff. And we think we can discern what's good and what isn't. And, and so we just kind of want to add Jesus to who we were before. But that's not what what Paul's talking about here. He says, take off one, put on the other one. He says, crucify the old self so you can have a new self. There's an old self and there's a new self. Um, I was thinking this morning, this isn't in our script, and Kevin knows that I do this when we preach together. Um, but have you ever heard the term putting lipstick on a pig? Anybody ever heard this before? Okay. So it kind of refers to uh, trying to dress up something that really isn't all that, isn't worth dressing up to make it look better than it is, right? So let's say you have this old dilapidated house with a really poor foundation and it does not have good bones, but you just keep slapping on new paint or new siding, or, but you still have a house that doesn't have a good foundation. And our life in Christ, our lives can be like that if we don't allow God to transform us, right? So 
if we're just adding a little bit of good deeds without being transformed, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. Right? And that's all you're going to remember from the sermon today now. <laughs> that's okay. Don't be the pig wearing lipstick. Okay? Take that home with you. No, so Paul knows that it can be hard for us to discern what's worth keeping and what's not. Right? Paul knows that that's, that's not really, that's hard for us. And so he, he presents these contrasts of our old life. He's saying these kinds of things are your old life. These kinds of things are your new life. And he focuses, in, in this passage, he's focusing mostly on our speech and on our actions, right? These contrasting lists, the contrast he shows us, how our, he's showing us that our new life is supposed to be truly different from our old life. It's not our old life dressed up. It's a brand new life. So he says, these, so these contrasts, you'll find they're opposites. They're not just doing a little better. They're opposites. He says, instead of falsehood, we're going to speak truth. Instead of stealing and stinginess and grasping for me, we're going to, be, we're going to work and be generous and share. Instead of unwholesome speech that's destructive, we're going to have constructive, beneficial speech. Instead of impurity, we're going to have holiness. Instead of foolishness and obscene talk, instead we're going to have things. We're going to speak thanksgiving. We're going to be thankful. So verse 29 specifically talks about the way we talk. Why is our speech so important? Our speech reflects what's in our hearts. And if Christ reigns and is having his way in us, we're going to sound like Christ in the things we say. Our speech will be helpful. It will be constructive. It'll be encouraging and truthful. It will build others up instead of tearing people down. It will unify instead of divide. Our speech will create reality. Just like God's speech created reality, our speech creates reality. And we want the reality it creates to be the reality of God's kingdom. So the question today is, do we use words in ways that bring honor and glory to God, or do we use our words to create the version of reality we want? Do we use our words to control and manipulate, to oppress, to divide, to get what we want, or what we think we want, what we think is best? Do we try to get our, own thing, our things our own way? Is that how we use our words? It's interesting to me that the ability to speak is one of the primary characteristics that sets people apart from the animals including pigs in lipstick. <laughs> That's all I'm going to remember now anyway. <laughs> but it's no surprise that this incredible gift of speech, of communication that we have been given is also one of the most misused gifts that we've been given. Scripture is abundantly clear in teaching us that people express who they are through the words they use. Matthew 12, 34 says, The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. There are multiple other translations that says, out of the abundance or out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Paul's point in this passage is that our speech, the things that come out of our mouths, should be completely different from the speech of those who do not follow Christ. Paul says that the speech of the world is characterized by excess, by an obsession with self, by worthlessness, by corruption. It's controlled by futile thinking. But as followers, as imitators who have submitted to Christ, we are called to proclaim a gospel and a message that is 100% opposed. It is the opposite to these ideals presented by the world. And our speech should reflect that. Additionally, Paul says that we should be characterized by using speech that is appropriate for the situation and for those who are present. The goal is to benefit those who listen. I love Ephesians 4.29 is one of my favorite. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. And that's usually where people stop. and like, oh, no, you need to hear this. But it goes on, it says, so that it 
will build them up according to their needs. Not what I think they need, but it will build them up according to their needs so it might benefit those who listen. I love the the New King James actually says this, that when we speak, we are to impart grace to the hearer. It's just such a beautiful picture. Do we use our words when we share truth? And the truth we learned is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. When we share truth, does it impart grace to those who are listening? Is that what our words do? Is this what the world hears when they listen to us? I love C.S. Lewis. He said, we have never met a mere mortal. And what he meant by that is that everyone we talk with, everyone we encounter, will spend eternity somewhere. And it's our responsibility as ambassadors for Christ to lovingly reflect Jesus and his love to those around us. And our speech does that. Or can do that. Our speech, though, it reflects what's in our hearts. Similar to what Kevin said, Luke 6, 45 puts it this way. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil pr person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what's in your heart. So in other words, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, if we're filled with Christ, if Christ reigns and is having his way in us, then we will sound like Jesus in the things we say. Our speech will be helpful and constructive, encouraging and truthful. It'll build up rather than tear down. What this means is I don't just get to say what I really feel like saying all the time. How many of you have thought, oh, I so wanted to say? And the Holy Spirit went, absolutely not. Why not? Because the Holy Spirit says our speech is to be helpful. It's to build up. It's to benefit others. It's for their needs. Now, our actions also flow from what's in our hearts, not just our speech. Our actions also come from what's in our heart. It comes from who or what we worship. Now, that's easy. We're like, yeah, we worship Jesus. But I want to challenge you with this. What you prioritize, what I prioritize, what's most important to me, that's who or what I worship. What I put first is who or what I worship. If making money is the most important thing to me, that's who or what I worship. So if sports are the most important thing to me, and that's what I prioritize, that's who or what I worship. If fashion, if, if leisure or my hobbies or fun or even my family are who I put first, and I build my life around that instead of around Jesus Christ. That's who or what I worship. So we got to get right who or what we worship, who's on the throne of my heart. Because if I don't, if my own comfort, my ideas, my logic, my way, if I'm the one who's on the throne and that's my priority, my actions will show it. And when I don't get my way, or I don't agree or understand if my comfort or security feels threatened, and that's my priority, my comfort and my security, what's going to come out? It's not going to be the fruit of the Spirit. It's going to be that other list that Paul gave, gave us. It's going to be the stealing, stinginess, dishonesty, manipulation, bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. Basically, discord is going to come out. It's going to be the result. However, if God is on the throne of my heart, what's going to come out is Jesus. I will work. I'll contribute. I'll be generous and forthright. I'll display kindness and compassion. 
I will begin to be the things that Jesus is. And we won't be perfect at it. But that's, that's the path we're on. That's the, the holiness journey. The other thing I'll do is I will forgive like Jesus forgives. That's what it says in our passage. passage. Forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. The whole point of this is that we are meant to be like Jesus. That's God's will for us. God's will for us isn't so much about what we do as it is about who we are. What we do is important. Scripture makes that clear. And God has prepared works in advance for us to do. But we will not be ready to do those works until we are who we are supposed to be in Christ. What we do and say flows from who we are. It's not the other way around. Paul reiterates Christ-likeness again and again. He reminds us that we are God's children. And as God's children, we are to imitate our Father by being like Jesus, by acting and living like Jesus, by walking in the way of love. Jesus told us that the two most important commandments were to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, Jesus did this because he was in right relationship with God. He was able to do this in every situation, in every single day, because he was in right relationship with God. He kept his eyes on his Father, his ears open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and he even said, I only do what I see my Father in heaven doing. He obeyed God perfectly. And because of that, he was the exact representation of God to the world. Jesus, though, went even further than just treating others the way we want to be treated, loving neighbor as self. He showed us what love really is and what it really looks like by laying down his life for others. This is the way of love. Even though we have a restored relationship with God through Jesus, we still have to adjust ourselves to that relationship by putting God, as Jenny said, in the proper place as King and Lord and ourselves as His subjects. It, last week, we, we read the pastor and passed it passage in James chapter 3 that was what, all, what the wisdom from God was. And one of the things that sometimes doesn't taste so good in our mouths, one of those things is wisdom from God is submissive. When we put God in the place of ruler and ourselves as followers that we submit to His authority, we are the worshipers, we are the children, we are the imitators of God. We are to imitate God's way of being, and this equates to right worship and to sacrificial love that, like Jesus showed us, holiness, the holy life that we are to live because God said, be holy because I am holy, over and over again. Holiness begins in the heart. First, God pours his love out for us. And then we have the opportunity to respond to the love that he pours out for us. And then he gives us, when we respond to that love, he gives us the Holy Spirit and pours his love into our hearts, into us. And what is our response? We then respond again by giving God his rightful place and allowing ourselves to be transformed by this love by the power and through the power of the Holy Spirit. But when he is on the throne, the holy life that he has for us begins with surrender, with a surrendered heart. A holy life begins with a surrendered heart. Walking in the way of love, living like Jesus love, lived, and loving like Jesus loved, surrendering, it's a choice. To imitate our Father, we have to choose to listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to choose what's good every single moment of every day. This is not a one-time, I surrender all choice. Yes, have that one time, but let that be the first of many. It requires us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Live according 
to his will and not our own. It requires us to live according to God's will, not my will, even when I don't feel like it. Especially when I don't feel like it. You see, God changes and transforms my desires as I fill my life with goodness and righteousness and truth. As I do what pleases God and seek God, seek to please God, seek to live like God, keep my eyes on God, I start to love the things that God loves. My desires will catch up with my obedience. Just like our children learn to walk and talk and laugh and interact by being with us, they learn what it means to be human in this world by being with us, by watching and listening to us. When we choose to fill our eyes and ears and minds with God and with his love, then God's love begins to pour out of us. As we imitate Christ's walk, choosing good, and as we focus, we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the way that Jesus loves, the way that he talks, the way he walks, then we become like Jesus. And just like our children take on our manner of speech, even our facial expressions. Sometimes I literally can feel my mother's facial expression coming on my face. Anybody else ever had that experience? Okay, like I can feel it. Or I know that I'm using my hands. I'm talking with my hand the exact way my mother did. Or you see a father and son walking, and that walk looks exactly the same. You've seen that, right? Just like our children come to be just like us, that happens because they spend time with us, because they're face-to-face -face with us, because they're walking with us. So as we walk with Jesus and we spend time with Jesus, we come to resemble Jesus. We can't be holy, holy without that relationship, without keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Those lists, all the lists, those are just the fruit that reveal where our lives are rooted. We've talked a lot about remaining rooted to the vine, connected to the vine, and being rooted in Christ. And if we're rooted in Christ, then our lives present produce or fruit that looks like Jesus. If you have rotten fruit, you can't fix the fruit. You have to fix the root. The Holy Spirit is what produces this fruit in our lives. Keeping in step with the Spirit, living according to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, says Galatians 5, 22 to 25. You guys know this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. In other words, all of this stuff is according to God's law and his will. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. I'm going to read that again. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature, that old self, they have nailed it to the cross and crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. We said this last week, but I want you once again to turn to the person next to you and say, we can't do this on our own. You cannot produce this kind of fruit. You're not able. <clears throat> it requires surrendering your will and your way to one who knows you better than you know you, to one who loves you far more than you love you, for one who created you to reflect his goodness and his glory, and he has a plan to use you to use every single one of us to make himself and this incredible love known throughout the world, to declare his glory among the nations. The coolest part of this, to me, there is zero risk. There is zero risk involved in this choice as we surrender. You have nothing to lose. 
except the weight of trying to perfect yourself. But you have everything to gain. Mere religion, a life of do's and don'ts, is exhausting at the end of the day. It leaves the heart heavy. But transformation is restorative. And it results in freedom and life. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And he said this to a people who were inundated with a list after list after list of do's and don'ts who were trying to perfect themselves and could, could not do it. And were beaten down because they could never be good enough. But Jesus offers new life, abundant life, transformation. A transformed and sanctified life is not only a joy, but it also is what points people to Jesus. A transformed life is what points people to the Savior. It's light. It's attractive. It's real and genuine. It has a truthful, genuine quality that gives credibility to the message. We can say all the right things, and we can do stuff, but if we are not transformed, our testimony really doesn't carry much weight if we're not truly different. We are to be set apart, but it isn't a matter of do's and don'ts. That's just the fruit. And to get to the fruit, you got to start with the root. You start with the heart. So the question today is, who's on the throne of your heart? Are you different? Because you live for Jesus, and Jesus is in control of your life. Are we fully surrendered? Are we God's children? Children imitate their parents. Are we God's children? loving and imitating our Lord. This requires surrender. It's not optional. This is a high calling, and it requires surrender. There is no other way. A holy life is a life surrendered fully to the love of God today, tomorrow, the next day, every second of every day. You may be wondering why we chose this for the last message that we get to speak to you. This message of surrender, of holiness. We love you guys so much. And, um, and we know that God has great plans for Hillcrest. God wants to work in this church. God wants to reach Vancouver through the people of Hillcrest. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. God wants to reach Vancouver through the people of Hillcrest. He wants people to be saved because they come into contact with you. We chose this message because God works through surrendered people. He works through a people who give him control. Who say, Lord, I don't know what it's going to look like. And, and I know I might be uncomfortable with it. But it's yours. I'm yours. Are you willing to be that kind of people, church? As a benediction... I have kind of a surrender covenant that if you are willing, I would like you to stand and read with me. And this is something we are speaking to the Lord. There should be a slide. Here we go. Just read this with me. I, I surrender, surrender my, my speech, speech acknowledging that, that if, if I don't, don't speak in love, love my, my words, words just are just noise. noise. I surrender, I surrender my mind, mind shape my understanding, understanding, and frame my knowledge in light of your love. I surrender my heart, 
May my faith be rooted in love for you alone. I surrender my body. May all my actions stem from and reflect your love for others. Lord, transform me into your likeness. Make me patient, kind, grateful, content, humble, encouraging, and respectful. May I become a person who seeks the good of others, bears with others, and forgives freely. May I find my delight in truth and mourn over evil and injustice. Jesus, grow in me a love that protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, a love that, like you, never fails. God, we thank you for this love that never fails, that never gives up, that never runs out. God, help us to live, to learn to live in this place of surrender that your will might be done through us on earth, that your kingdom might come through us on earth as it is in heaven and the whole world would know that when they see us, that you love them. That when they see us, they would know what you look like, what you sound like. And that through us, everyone that we come into contact with would experience your love, your peace, and your joy. God, use us to transform your world in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you.